43rd, I think they waited a couple years before they came around. <clears throat> Mike and Cheryl, thank you. Um, Dick, thanks for playing it straight. I guess, uh, I guess you know if I had the, the word after yours that it, it was no use <laughs> trying not to play it straight. Um, this is uh, really quite uncomfortable for me um, to, for, to be called out for this recognition. I feel uh, rather guilty um, to, uh, to be the one standing here. Um, you see, I'm Jewish, I married a Catholic. There's so much guilt in our household, we could power a small village. <laughs> but I want to thank everybody for their support um, because coming out for an event in support of a good cause is what we do in this community and what everybody here does so many times. And I know the demands that people have on their time and how important uh, their time is. But this event is, and the response has been amazing, and the ADL and the Bush Center are both focusing on freedom, democracy, and tolerance. And this event goes a long way in increasing the collective impact of both organizations. Something like this makes me pause for a minute and reflect on just what I'm fortunate for. And I've had three really wonderful, great gifts in my life. The first is education. I want to thank my mother, who's here today, who enrolled me at a school up near Preston Royal called St. Mark's. I was there in 1969 and stayed there through graduation. And it's been a 50-year relationship um, with that school. And she set an example for me and my sisters that everything starts with a great education. And when you're, and when you're there, get all you can out of the education that you're given. So mom, your role model has been more to me and Susie and Paula than we could ever express. So thank you for that. I've also been blessed with really quality relationships, both professionally and personally. Professionally, it started in Fort Worth, Texas, in Richard Rainwater's office, where I had the good fortune of, of officing there from 1989 to 2000. It was a magical, inspirational, and fun time. John Goff, Harlan Cornvase, and Richard Squires are here, and they know what I'm talking about. John said it was like a pickup basketball game for capitalists every day. You didn't know what was going to happen, but you knew it was going to be fun. Richard taught us the importance of quality relationships, surrounding yourself with great people, and maintain the youthful curiosity and intellectual honesty that always comes with a new business opportunity. And he lived alive. And that was so infectious, and to be around that was a real gift. He encouraged us to think big. He'd say, go ahead, think big. Somebody's got to, it might as well be us. And that was really liberating for somebody who might have otherwise thought to hold back. Then at NGP, my partnership wouldn't have been anything without David Alban, John Foster, and Dick Covington. We grew together, we were in each other's foxholes, we had each other's backs, and we accomplished a heck of a lot in an industry that for the most part really sucked. <laughs> but we built a business investing in oil and gas, we became friends for life. David and I were partners for 28 years and never had a stitch of paper between us. David, I love you, thank you for being here and it was the greatest professional gift anybody could have was to be with part, your partner. Thank you, David. And along the way, we, we made a dent in the way that people look at the oil and gas industry, educated the asset allocation community, created an entrepreneurial set of culture that didn't really exist in this industry, and literally that industry changed the world, and to have a small part of it was an honor. We built a business around finding great people, aligning our interests, putting the relationship above all else, being decidedly pro-management, and then trying to get out of their way. Some of us got out of their way a little bit more easily and more quickly than others. <laughs> Phil, you're here. Steve Gray, Mike Grimm, Kelsey, Lon Kyle, thank you for coming out. I hope I didn't get in your way too much, but um, you guys were absolutely fantastic. And, and the truth be told, we learned more from you guys than we could ever, ever get in any textbook. So thank you for all the fantastic leadership that you guys experienced and in this, in this, in this industry that was really devoid of really, really strong management. Now it, is, now it is not. 
And now at NGP, it's an honor for me to watch the firm go to the next generation and do what other franchises really are unable to do in, the, in a, the investment business, and that is to sustain itself after the co-founders have passed the torch. And I trust that the next generation of NGP partners will care for that culture and take it to a whole nother level. Because culture isn't an important thing, it's the only thing. Because that is what you build everything else on top of. Without a strong culture, failure will be inevitable. Personally, my relationships have been equally rewarding. Julie, almost 30 years, the love of my life, you exude care for others in everything that you do and everything that you touch. That care is a hero to so many, and you're my personal hero. I hope I can keep up with you and live up to your standards and all that you set um, for the community and for our family. Thank you. <laughs> Daniel and Rachel, who aren't here, um, they're working, um, which is good. Um, and, and now they're great young adults, and uh, they can watch the video. Um, but it's time to meet, for me to start learning from them. And the friends, um, the friends in this community are, uh, are bedrock to, to me and my family, um, not for just being there, but for really being there. When adversity hits, you guys keep me level-headed and help out, offering constructive criticism when it's appropriate, even when it may not be appropriate. <laughs> Table 36, you know exactly who you are. <laughs> the, and then finally, my blessing wouldn't be complete without recognizing this Dallas community. This city is really special and special to me. Growing up here, um, where it was obvious that we stand on the shoulders of those that came before us. I was fortunate. I didn't feel anti-Semitism. I think, when I look back on it, that growing up in the late six, in the 60s and 70s, so many leaders around were, uh, were commingled in this community. Names like Marcus, Meyerson, Nasher, Steinhardt, and many other names mixed in with McDermott, Johnson, Green, Crow, and Hunt, and other names I only know as Freeways, Stemmons, Thornton, and Woodall Rogers. <laughs> that plus 12 years at St. Mark's with its Episcopal roots, I never felt unwelcome in any, in any time. Because I was blessed and never experienced overt anti-Semitism, maybe it existed in subtle ways, but ways that I felt were kind of normal. Back in the day, we had segregated country clubs, but we had the Jewish Columbian Club. It all seemed kind of petty to me, quite frankly. I just wanted to swim, fish the lake, play golf, and enjoy bingo. But today, I feel like those, those pettinesses are, are behind us. I feel that many of the barriers are gone. Some I helped break, some big ones and some small ones. Um, I'm quite proud that Daniel's Bar Mitzvah Party was the first Bar Mitzvah Party at Brook Hollow Country Club. Um, it, they were fantastic, it was great. Um, in fact, one of my dearest friends pointed out that Jesus, the bartender, um, was so accommodating, they had his badge, and he said, hey Ken, did you notice that Brook Hollow was so accommodating they had Jesus serving beer and wine to the friends? <laughs> now, I'm not naive. <laughs> Tom, you know that was you right there. Anyway, Tom, <laughs> uh, that's what friends are for. Um, but I'm not naive. And me and my peers, many in this room, were lucky because the battles were fought by others before us in this town so that we could enjoy the peace. We could assimilate and have a Jewish identity. They weren't mutually exclusive. We were all different somehow, and yet that was okay. Or so I thought. And that makes what's happening now even more tragic when I see the blatant targeting of Jews at places like the Pittsburgh Synagogue or other minority groups being targeted like in El Paso. You've heard them described a little bit today. And when I see and hear about parts of our Dallas community, like the fact that we probably have not progressed as much as we think we have in race relations at all, I am deeply saddened because I know the beauty and strength that comes from a community that respects differences and practices tolerance and welcomes all types. I am often ashamed of people in this city when I hear of overt and even covert incidences of racial, religious, ethnic division with ignorance at their core. So for me, I feel that by example, I need to double down, to be a testament of tolerance and acceptance and have that acceptance to be contagious. 
and to make an impact in this region. So how can I be an example? First, set one. Maintain a sense of purpose and clarity and identity across my work, both professionally and in this community, is to lead by example. Second, go all in. Love what you do and where you do it, and it's the only way I know how to be. At work, I did it for 28 years, and I was all in. In the community, I feel like I was the beneficiary of so many who worked so hard, and now it's my turn to pay it forward. Now at the Bush Center, I have a chance to do both. We serve the community at large by advancing ideas supporting economic and political freedom, and a workplace where I get to help coach up 85 incredibly talented and mission-oriented leaders. President Bush's example shows the effect of principled leadership and what that can have on so many. Whether or not you agreed with him, when he was in office, you knew he was doing what he believed was right for the country, not for him personally. Meeting all of the people who worked for him, who were in that foxhole with him uh, during his eight years, he had the backs of the people who worked for him, for him, no matter how junior they were in the administration. And in policy, he let his values come through. For example, when he dealt with China, he dealt with them because he had to. But he made the point and told the leader as such that when I come to see you, I will also go visit the dissidents. And along the way, he developed a very, very close relationship with the Dalai Lama. They are not mutually exclusive to do business with people you have to do business with, yet calling them out when you need to. And then finally, I can stay hungry. Hungry for results, hungry to do more. Shimon Perez, who I had the honor with of dining one year at Davos, um, stood up and said, something very profound. He says, Jews have contributed a lot of things to society, but they've contributed one really great thing, dissatisfaction. <laughs> I understand this because I feel like there's always more to do and we can always do something better. And that's why the work of the ADL and the Bush Center around freedom, democracy, and tolerance is so important. We should recognize that democracy and freedom are not the default conditions throughout human history. Perhaps this is why we refer to our democracy as the American experiment, even though it's 250 years old. The Chinese view, their view of a state-centric system over centuries as superior and are taking great joy that we are at each other's throats. I think we're in the midst of a really interesting struggle that will be studied 100 years from now. The question is whether this time will be studied in the sociology department or the anthropology department. Sociologists who study dynamics of groups or anthropologists who study traits of human beings and our evolution. Democracy at its heart is a sociological experiment. We have self-governed, we have chosen to self-govern. We've established processes for peaceful transitions of power. We sacrifice some personal liberties in order to guarantee that we respect minority rights. Our founders were so suspicious of our nature they said men are not angels, that they established a structure of checks and balances to ensure that the Constitution is very carefully and slowly applied in this constant tug of war. And they were even not sure that that was, needed to be, that that was gonna be perfect, so they safeguarded the fourth estate over the whole thing, and that is the freedom of the press. And they further separated church and state so that another undue influence couldn't enter the political sphere. In short, it was sociological experiment number one in group dynamics. We, to allow us to live peacefully together, each group had to give up some autonomy for the good of the whole, however the disparate that whole may be. And we have learned as Americans that it is possible both to defend and support free speech, peaceful and civil assembly, which I do, and as individuals to stand firmly against bigotry, racism, anti-Semitism, and intolerance, even if those values are being shouted from the public square. Our democracy may be raucous, but it's not evil. Over time though, absent group order, as studied by the sociologists, humans have reverted to the tribalism studied more in the anthropology department. Examples are everywhere throughout history. There's tribal warfare all over Africa, the Middle East, China, the former Soviet Union, fighting based on ethnic or religious differences when there is no rule of law or order. These divisions run deep, and it takes a strong rule of law and order to preserve this tolerance, or a culture of tolerance, to hold that society together. 
If it is kept under wraps by a strong man, it's only temporary, because once that force is gone, then conflict will erupt. And this isn't limited to just the developing world. In developed economies, it happens as well. Yugoslavia was an interesting example. For 47 years, it was a country. And when the Soviet Union broke apart, Yugoslavia broke back into countries almost exactly along ethnic lines. There was no intermingling or commingling during the, that 50 years. They didn't build a bond under one umbrella. Even in democracies, we saw like in World War II, these democracies proved fragile. When serious hardship was experienced, when it was apparent that the public servants got, got it wrong, it gave rise to populism, which brought with it the blame game, intolerance, nativism, protectionism, and isolationism. And we're experiencing this again today, where the rule of law is being undermined by popularly elected leaders. Maduro, Putin, Erdogan, Duda, Orban, they all got elected and then worked to systematically undermine the institutions that brought them into power, the free press, the independent judiciary, and ultimately free elections. Those places are ripe for rise of tribalism, and we see it exactly with the rise of the nationalist parties throughout Europe. And we're seeing these same signs again in the United States today. Something that has been brewing for quite some time has reared its ugly head. It is too easy to blame a single person at the top for fanning the flame. While I am dismayed by poor leadership on the issue from the top, I am more interested as to why those embers of hate exist in the first place. Feelings that these voices have impunity doesn't explain the existence of those white supremacists, one major one of whom came right from this community and my community. And as tolerant humanity, we should not need to rely on a single person to keep a lid on it. Something else is going on. If during a period of economic prosperity, relative full employment, relative peacetime, we see a rise of intolerance and anti-Semitism and xenophobic and racist behavior in this country, something else is going on. People have begun to sort themselves geographically in this country, both physically and online, and that's very dangerous. The lawless online world where humanity can show its true state of nature is a perfect laboratory to show what might happen when the rules of law don't exist. And the result is sad. Less tolerance, less empathy, less civility, and in the end, potentially less order. That's why the work we do is so important, and these messages are critical. I want to congratulate the ADL and Jonathan Greenblatt, their CEO who's here today, whose leadership is so important, and locally, Cheryl Drazen and her board, who are carrying these messages throughout the community. I want to also congratulate this entire community of leaders who opened up the Holocaust Museum here in town, which widened the aperture to include human rights more broadly. I am optimistic, however, that there are so many great people in the silent, massive majority that are not evil. They're not full of hatred. But we're in a period where outrage gets the positive reinforcement. I want us to recommit to breaking that cycle by not rewarding the ugly behavior. My call to action is for all of us to have courage. Number one, courage to renew relationships. Ask what you can do for each other. I think that's what de Tocqueville saw as most special about this country the decency, service orientation, and participation at the individual level. Have the courage to be kind, especially to those you disagree with. It's okay to agree to disagree without condemning the worth of the other person. The ADL and the Bush Center working is an example where a left of center organization and a right of center organization can come together to promote common principles. President George Bush and Ellen DeGeneres set a great example, sitting next to each other at the cowboy game. I think Jerry placed him, but anyway, and it's a, but it's a shame that she had to actually go out and defend herself for sitting next to somebody at a football game. President Bush and Michelle Obama with his Altoid diplomacy at two funerals show kindness to the world. And this dinner tonight, believe me, I know everybody here. I have friends here who would have very spirited conversations with other people who are here. But tonight we put that aside and we share a common experience and celebrate people and civility. Tolerance starts with mutual respect, not digging in and doubling down on division. President Bush said it best in the memorial service in the summer of 16 for the fallen officers in Dallas, when he said, too often we judge other groups by their worst examples while judging ourselves by our best intentions. And this has strained our bonds of understanding and common purpose. 
But Americans, I think, we have a great advantage. To renew our unity, we only need to remember our values. We need to have courage to help each other. There's no better feeling in the world. The recent Dallas tornado saw neighbors helping neighbors. We did not sort chainsaws based upon political ideology. Let's not wait for another crisis to bring us together where we can put our differences aside. Our leaders must also have courage to make a principled vote if necessary. We are the world's beacon for freedom and democracy. The world is watching. So we must prevail and we must give the sociologists of the future the data they need to study why human exceptionalism flourished in our time. Let's leave anthropologists to study Neanderthal creatures and instead work to reinforce the magic that happens when democratic and tolerant societies flourish and human beings are safe, they're safe to achieve, to create, to enjoy, and to live. Thank you very much.